This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream, which is, just for this week, at its cheapest ever price of $11.59 a year. Get access to bonus TLDR content and all our videos and podcasts ad-free by signing up to the CuriosityStream Nebula Bundle. It's linked below. When Putin invaded Ukraine back in late February, few analysts saw it coming. This wasn't just because Russia had insisted for the past few months that it wasn't going to invade, but also because, well, this wasn't really Putin's style. In the past, Putin had expressed a preference for so-called hybrid warfare over conventional warfare, and the mild-mannered bureaucratic Putin of the 2000s is almost unrecognisable from the furious ethno-nationalist Putin we see today. So, in this video, we're going to try our best to trace back Putin's politics, starting from when he first came to power in 2000, and try to explain how we, and he, got here. We're going to split Putin's politics into three areas. The first is the technocratic era, which lasts roughly from 2000 until 2010. The second is the conservative era, which lasts roughly from 2010 until 2020. The third and final era is the nationalist era, which roughly begins in 2020 and is ongoing today. Now, in anticipation of a flurry of comments disagreeing with our taxonomy, a couple of disclaimers. These divisions aren't perfect for a couple of reasons. They're not mutually exclusive. You can, after all, be a technocratic conservative, a conservative nationalist, or a nationalist technocrat. Nor do they perfectly map onto Putin's politics. Putin's politics have elements of conservatism throughout, for example. Nonetheless, we think this is a useful way of framing things because, well, who doesn't like splitting things up into neat bunches of three, with each new era beginning at the start of a new decade? Anyway, disclaimers aside, let's get into it, starting with Putin's first era, the technocratic era. When Putin came to power in 2000, the Russian state was a mess, economically and politically. In 1998, after a massive financial crisis, the ruble collapsed in value, inflation jumped to 84%, and the Russian state defaulted on its domestic debts. While the Russian economy recovered surprisingly quickly, when Putin came to power, Russia's GDP and GDP per capita were still about 40% below their 1997 highs, leaving Russia significantly poorer than its European neighbours. To give you some context, in 2000, Russia's GDP per capita was about $1,800, roughly half that of Lithuania and slightly more than a third of Poland. Politically, the Russian state wasn't in great nick either. Political power was split between the government and oligarchs, and the Russian state didn't have a clear monopoly on violence, with criminal gangs running parallel policing operations. Anyway, Putin quickly realised that, if Russia was going to return to prominence, it needed to sort out both its economy and its politics. His first foreign policy review, completed in June 2000, concluded that Russia would be unable to defend its national interest unless the economy was significantly improved. So that's what Putin set about doing. The first thing to do was create a functioning modern state. Putin spent the early 2000s cracking down on the oligarchs and centralising power in the Kremlin. The most famous instance of this was the jailing of Russia's one-time richest man, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, on charges of fraud and tax evasion, which was clearly intended to show the oligarchs that ultimately Putin was in charge now. At a meeting with the oligarchs in February 2000, Putin said that the relationship between the Kremlin and the oligarchs will be the same as the relationship between the Kremlin and anyone else. The same as, quote, the owner of a small bakery or a shoe repair shop. In July, Putin explicitly told them to stay out of politics. Oligarchs that ran media businesses to push political agendas like Vladimir Guzinsky and Boris Berezovsky were exiled or jailed. Putin's extreme crackdowns in Chechnya can also be seen through the same lens. Putin needed to demonstrate that the Russian state, like any functioning state, had a monopoly of violence in its territory. Having asserted the Kremlin's supremacy, Putin then set about restoring the Russian economy. He privatised expensive state industries, reformed Russia's broken tax system, and then set about paying off Russia's debts. Although he was helped by a jump in oil prices, in this respect, Putin was a fantastically capable technocrat. Russia's debt to GDP fell from 92% in 1999 to 6.5% in 2008, 
while GDP rose from about $200 billion to $1.7 trillion, and GDP per capita rose from $1,300 to nearly $12,000, catching up with its European neighbours. This is part of the reason Putin is so popular in Russia. In the first nine years of his tenure, GDP per capita increased by nine times. Anyway, this all begins to change around the turn of the decade, when, having stabilised Russia's politics and economy, Putin starts to focus on conservative cultural values. In his annual meeting with leading Russian specialists, in 2013, Putin argued that Russia needs to hold on to its, quote, Christian values, which other Western democracies are apparently rejecting in favour of some sort of militant secularism. After his re-election in 2012, Putin implemented a whole load of socially conservative policies, including the infamous law banning gay propaganda and a law banning, quote, questioning the integrity of the Russian nation. Many of these laws essentially just gave the state more surveillance and censorship powers. During this time, Putin also increased the influence of the Russian Orthodox Church, which was similarly concerned about the growing cultural influence of secularism. He also maintained a conservative fiscal policy, running tiny budget deficits and occasionally surpluses to keep the national debt low. In terms of foreign policy, Putin framed his focus on traditional values as an implicit rejection of American universalism, which involved the US going around exporting American democracy as a universal good. This was partly a symptom of the fact that relations with the West had deteriorated. In the first years of his premiership, Putin sounded remarkably pro-Western. In 2000, he said that Russia is part of Western European culture, we are Europeans, and even made moves to join NATO. This all changed in the 2000s, largely in response to the Bush administration's undiplomatic unilateralism, which was the focus of Putin's now infamous Munich Security Conference speech in 2007. In the years leading up to that speech, the Bush administration had withdrawn from the Rhone Statute of the ICC, gone into Iraq without UN authorization, refused to ratify a treaty limiting NATO deployment on Russia's flank, and even suggested that the US wouldn't pay its UN fees unless it got better voting rights. The last straw was in 2008, when the Bush administration pushed their European counterparts into committing to accept Ukraine and Georgia into NATO one day. So that was Putin's conservative era, conservative domestic policies combined with a newfound antipathy towards the West. On to his last era, the nationalist era. Essentially, in the last few years, Putin has taken a softer line with Russian nationalists and taken a new interest in ethnic Russian populations. The first clear example of this pivot are the March 2020 constitutional reforms, which made explicit reference to ethnic Russians as the state-forming people of the Russian Federation. Previously, the constitution only made reference to Russian citizens, and the Russian state was wary of even using the term Ruski, which refers to ethnic Russians, instead preferring the neutral Rosian, which just means anyone who lives in Russia. The Russian state had even used its new censorship laws, specifically the Article 282 hate speech laws, to suppress any excessively nationalistic speech. A Russian blogger was even imprisoned for using the phrase Great Russian People, which a judge ruled was offensive to minorities. In 2018, Putin decriminalised Article 282, and then a few years later proposed these new constitutional changes, which were conspicuously nationalist. To stress, Putin hasn't always been a nationalist. In 2008, he actually said that the slogan, Russia for Russians, a sentiment that is consistently supported by half of Russians in opinion polls, is for, quote, fools and provocateurs. Putin's new ethno-nationalist streak has been increasingly clear in the last year. His new Russia policy makes explicit reference to historic Russian peoples, and his article on the history of unity of the Russians and Ukrainians, published in July, references the large number of ethnic Russians to deny the existence of Ukraine as an independent nation. In recent months, Putin regularly refers to Russia's obligation to ethnic Russians to justify his invasion. So that's Putin's political journey so far. Hopefully, it's given you a bit more of a sense of Putin the politician. You've likely heard us talk about Nebula before, but it's at its lowest price ever. So give me one minute to explain why you should care. And as always with TLDR, there's three points. Firstly, signing up to Nebula gives you a ton of additional TLDR content. 
we release some videos exclusively on Nebula. Those are full length proper videos and a super fun studio tour video. We also release longer versions of some videos. In fact, we release a longer version of our show, The Daily Briefing on Nebula, every single weekday. That's a lot more TLDR every day. Secondly, everything on Nebula is ad-free. That's not just TLDR, but all of your favourite creators like Wendover Productions, Real Life Law, Polymatter, Legal Eagle, and Half as Interesting. All this content is ad-free, so there'd be no mid-rolls and I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Thirdly, signing up and watching on Nebula really helps the channel. Here's the maths. TLDR viewers signing up to Nebula has significantly improved our ability to monetize our content, which has allowed us to begin employing more staff and investing in new technology to improve our content. You might not notice it yet, but you will soon, and signing up is so helpful. So you're convinced, right? Did I do it in a minute? Who knows, it's pre-recorded. Anyway, if you do want to sign up to Nebula, the cheapest way to do so is with the CuriosityStream Nebula Bundle deal. That way, signing up to CuriosityStream for the crazy low price of $11.59 a year gets you free access to Nebula. That's right, two streaming services for less than a dollar a month. And by the way, that crazy low price only lasts for this week. And CuriosityStream is awesome. It contains absolutely boatloads of high quality documentaries on all kinds of topics I know TLDR viewers will love. So if you want both for $11.59 a year, this week only, then the link's down below. And if not, well, I can't say I haven't tried to convince you. Thanks for your support.